We've been going through the book of Corinthians. Uh, we are going to be chapter 14 today. So chapter 12, 13, and 14 are all about spiritual gifts in the book of Corinthians. The book of Corinthians is written to the city of Corinth. The city of Corinth uh, is a very spiritual, religious city, uh, but also very pagan. So not spiritual in like the legalistic, don't do that sort of way, but more uh, like hippy dippy, run around in circles in the woods type of crazy. Uh, so all kinds of weird stuff going on. And in the midst of that, then you have this church that starts because, you know, Jesus died and resurrected from the dead. Paul then comes along to kind of be the mentor to them to help them get figured, uh, get things figured out. Uh, and then 12, 13, and 14 are all about spiritual gift issues they are having within the church. So chapter 12, then we talked about here are the spiritual gifts. Here's the various things that have been given to a church. Uh, you need that matrix of gifts to be effective to convey the gospel. Uh, and then chapter 13, he kind of hits pause, but not really to say, but even more so important than the spiritual gifts, the way that you should be conveying the gospel, the way you should be doing this is through love. And so here's how to love to make sure you're loving right, because none of these gifts matter if you can't get along. So make sure you're getting along. And then chapter 14, we jump into, uh, and it gets weird. So we're going to get weird this morning uh, as we look at it, because he starts to deal with uh, some some kind of funny issues when you put it into context. Uh, the next week is the one where uh, he makes the statement that women shouldn't talk in church. So if that sounds interesting to you, feel free to show up next week. We'll discuss that then. Uh, but this week we are going to look at uh, two specific spiritual gifts that seem to have taken the forefront of what's going on in the church and are kind of taking over services to the place that they've become detrimental. Uh, and so Paul wants to kind of set it right. So before we go any further, let's just jump in and read what he writes, and then we will, we will go from there. He picks up here, chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love. Earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand... The one who prophesies speaks to people for their, for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophecy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so the church may be built up. So here we go. What in the world is he talking about? What's speaking in tongues? What's prophecy? What's going on? Depending on your background in church, uh, you probably have some preconceived ideas about it. Uh, if you are non-charismatic and don't come out of that, this is probably like the weird thing that you see on TV that you're like, those people are crazy. And then on the other end of it, if you are charismatic, this is a thing that is like your cross to die on that you cling to as this is the evidence that you really know Jesus. And if we're not doing this, then you're not saved. And that's what I grew up in. And so to me, when you start to look at it, we got to find the middle ground somewhere, uh, you know, and actually approach this from a biblical worldview as opposed to just what feels good and what's right. So what is this thing and what's going on? Well, uh, chapter 14 in Corinthians is super unique in the Greek aspect of this, because it's the only place where we have two different words used for speaking in tongues in Greek. Now, in Acts, they normally use the word dialectica, which is dialect, right? That's where we get that word. That's the most common use. There's twice in the book of Acts that it uses the other word, which is glossolalia. Glossolalia, uh, glossary, that's where that comes from, is the other word. So dialectica means uh, languages, right? So when it says speaking in tongues, they, they'll say speaking in languages that's, that they didn't know, that's what that is conveyed. And that's the most common use in the book of Acts. Glossolalia is speaking uh, a language that no one knows is the implication. So that's weird, right? Like that's like, so, because you're, you're saying that something is a language, but you're also saying that nobody knows what that language is. Charismatics in the room, this is where we pull our uh, speaking in tongue movement from. Going to Bible college, uh, when I went to Lincoln, Lincoln is not a uh, cessationist college. They're not like there is no Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues is sinful like some people, but they would challenge any assembly kid, why do you believe the way you believe, at least be able to back it biblically. This was always where you ended up, was this chapter, because this chapter does start to convey that there may be some sort of spiritual thing that can take place where you can speak in a language um, that is heavenly related. 
And so when it starts to talk about speaking in tongues and prophesying, this is what he is talking about, this thing that's going on. Now, what we know, because uh, as we move through this and as we go on here, is these things are being exploited in this church in Corinth. They've elevated these things to the place that they're above the other spiritual gifts, which is why Paul spends all of chapter 12 saying, you need all of these gifts and not just the ones that you like. Speaking in tongues is one of those polarizing ones because it makes people feel weird, right? Because it's out of the realm of what's natural. That's why it feels weird. When you start to brush up uh, to the part of God and the aspects of God that don't relate to a natural uh, cause and effect, this is how the world works type of thing, then you start to feel strange. Now, you take that and you put all kinds of uh, weirdness and things out of context and stuff that you see on YouTube and on uh, TikTok, and you start to go like, I don't know what any of that is, and it freaks me out. All I'm asking you this morning is to recognize Paul saw fit to take a whole chapter in the book of Corinth, a big chunk of his letter, and explain to the church how this works and why it's important. So instead of being like, this weirds me out and I don't want anything to do with it, we maybe should approach it from the other place of, if this is a gift and a thing that is available to Christians, maybe we should try to understand what it is. Because Paul says, I would like for all of you to speak in tongues, but even more so, I would like you to prophesy. So what's prophesy? Well, what's that? This is a wholly different word. And what's going on? Prophecy is exactly what it sounds like it is. Prophecy is God speaking to people through someone else directly. So the Old Testament is full of prophets. In the New Testament, the spiritual gift is prophecy. You don't really have so much in the New Testament uh, prophets as you do in the Old Testament. They are around, right? When Paul in the book of Acts decides he's going to go back to Jerusalem, they come to him and say, uh, there's the prophet who has prophesied over you and said you shouldn't go back because they're going to kill you. And Paul goes, I'm going anyway. So that, that idea is still around in the New Testament. It's not like, you know, they've completely done away with it. And so people that will say, you know, you can't have prophets and you can't, that's, eh, you're in an iffy area. Prophecy, though, is how God speaks to people. So if you've ever been to Vintage on a Sunday morning and we've ever had a word come at the end, right? You, the, the ones who don't know who say to me afterwards, do you and that lady or do you and that guy, do you guys talk about what they're going to say before they say it? N no, because that's prophetic gift is what that is. That's God speaking through somebody who's being faithful and allowing God to speak through them. Now, so you know, uh, they are not like in a trance, okay? We don't believe that like God takes over their body and they're like, oh, it's not something weird. We don't have to get creepy and strange about it. It's just as if God were to speak to them and say, I want this to be said, and then that person is obedient and says it. It's not that much different than preaching if you really stop and think about it, right? I pray, I prep, I figure out what I'm going to say, and then God leads where we go. So you can see then why Paul might go, this seems to be important, uh, we should do this. He says the one who speaks in tongues, uh, unless they in is interpreted, doesn't work, so that we want the church to be built up, the prophecy builds the church, so these two things we should focus on, it should be important, right? So that's what he's starting to drive at. When you then move on through scripture here. He says this, now brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments, such as the flute or the harp, do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves. If with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you'll be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourself, since you're eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Essentially what he is saying is, be careful how you practice speaking in tongues in front of other people because if you all just stand in a room and speak in tongues, you're not really accomplishing what the purpose of the church is, which is to build the body of Christ. Now, if you're charismatic, you may be like, I'm uncomfortable with this because that's my favorite thing to do. I, I didn't write it. Paul did. And you, you cannot divorce the Bible from the expectation for how a church service is supposed to go. So what do we believe here at Vintage? I believe in speaking in tongues. 
I believe that's a legitimate thing that can happen. I believe everybody has opportunity for speaking in tongues. Where we differ from charismatic churches is, I don't think speaking in tongues is necessary for you to have some deeper walk with the Lord. I think it's a tool that's available to you, and I think by all means you should ask God for it. Next up, I don't think we need to do weird charismatic speaking in tongues services where we bring people down front and we play music over and over again and we tell people, repeat after me, such as untie my, uh, my bow tie or I would like to buy a Hyundai. Repeat that over and over again and eventually you'll speak in tongues. I think that cheapens what God intends for you to have. And I think you're much better to say if this is interesting to you or you're wondering about this in your own private edification, your own time where you grow in your faith, where you pray, where you read your Bible. You just say to God, hey God, I'd like to speak in tongues. Right? Like when the Bible says that when a, when a child asks his parent for a gift, the, the father or the mother will give the gift to the child. They don't withhold it. That's how the gifts of the Spirit are. It's not like you got to jump through certain hoops. you got to stand on one foot, raise your right hand, open your mind to the moving of God. God just wants to give you the, this gift and this ability, which is for your own personal edification. Meaning also then, if you're in a worship service... And you want to have your own time where you're taking communion or whatever, and you want to speak in tongues, that's fine. But you should do that with some discretion. Because if you get too weird, and you got somebody who's going to come into the room, then they don't know what to do. Paul lays it out. He, he's not afraid to tell you. This is why chapter 14 is so pragmatic. Verse 13, therefore, one who speaks in tongues should pray that he may interpret. For I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? Well, I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he goes, when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongue more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I'd rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So what's he talking about? Well, he's saying, if you all stand in a room and you just babble away, people, you're not effectively conveying the gospel. Because remember, 12, 13, and 14 are in the context of, I'm giving you these spiritual gifts so that you can be effective in the world. It's not effective if you, if you preach in a language that no one knows. It's not effective if you teach in a language no one knows what's going on, which gives you some insight to how crazy this church in Corinth had to be, right? When people want to preach messages and say the charismatic Corinthians, that's probably true. Like, imagine how crazy a church service has to be that Paul has to confront and say, hey, guys, if you all stand in the room and scream and speak in tongues and people walk in the room, nobody knows what anybody's saying. I would rather you just say five words that people know than to say 10,000 of what you're doing. It's important to Paul that what we do is effective to reaching lost people, which has always been my critique of the charismatic movement. I love charismatics. I grew up charismatic. I'm a closeted charismatic, to be real honest with you. But I also can see the frustration from the place of if you have people who know nothing about Jesus and you're trying to introduce them to Jesus, the charismatic stuff can be a real off-putting turning away to people who don't know what you're doing, right? Like if you show up to church and your life's a mess and you're trying to find direction and you're trying to find hope in the cross and you walk into the back of the room and there's people Jericho marching and running across the front and you got people in the corner babbling and you got people that are laid on the ground and you got the music's just playing the same note over and over and over. Like you can see where you're like, I'm not real sure what I'm supposed to do in here. Which is what Paul is getting at. He goes on, brothers, do not be children in your own thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it's written by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to, these, to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus, tongues are a sign for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are all out of your mind? But if all prophecy and unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. 
He is called to account by all. The secret of his hearts are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Paul's quoting Isaiah 28, 11 through 12 there. He's setting up a point that seems to be contradictory. It seems to contradict itself because what's he say? He says, uh, when you get here, the tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. While prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers but for believers. So tongues are for believers, prophecy is for unbelievers. Then he goes on to say, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say you're out of your mind? Paul, that seems to contradict itself. You say up here that tongues are for unbelievers, and then down here you say that uh, if you speak in tongues, unbelievers are going to think you're insane. And then you do the same thing with prophecy. You say prophecy is for believers, but in the bottom it says if prophecy and unbeliever enters and convicted, this doesn't make any sense, and I think you've gone crazy. And what's hilarious is you can find commentaries where people have lost their mind. There are people in this world who are Bible dorks who have rewritten this and they say this is one of the spots where we have a mistake in the Bible, and what happened was somebody mistranslated this, which shows you that they have no concept of um, how rabbis teach because what you probably actually have here is a rabbinical paradox. Rabbis love a good paradox. They like to play on words and say things that contradict each other to make a point. Because uh, you can say things and two things can be true that don't seem to agree with each other. Let me explain it to you like this. When Paul says speaking in tongues is for believers, what does he mean by that? Well, he means that speaking in tongues is a gift given by God for the edification of your spiritual self. Edification means a feeding, taking care of, nurturing. That's what that's for. So I'm going to give you this gift, and that's for you. Unbelievers can't speak in tongues because the requirement to speak in tongues is the Holy Spirit. The only way you get the Holy Spirit is if you're a believer. So speaking in tongues are obviously for believers. But then the paradox and the fun Paul's having is he goes, but it's for private believer. It's for your personal time. So then if you are in a room where your motivation is to be the body of Christ for lost people, to be a light in the darkness, to reach out, and all you're doing is just feeding yourself and you're not worried about how you're feeding anybody else, you're going to run those people off because they don't know what you're doing. Which means then in the same breath, uh, this doesn't benefit when we talk about it for an unbeliever. Right? So there's a contradiction, but that contradiction does work when you put it into the context of what Paul has taught. The same is true of prophecy. When he says prophecy is for the unbeliever, well, that's because if you've ever sat in a church and you've heard God call out to you or speak to you and you're an unbeliever and God is using one of his followers who's being obedient and that spoke to you, then that's for you. That's not for the believer in the room. You're an unbeliever, so that prophecy is now for you. That makes total sense. When I was 18 years old, we went through all kinds of garbage at the church we were currently attending, and I was done. Done. I thought Christians were fake. I was not real convinced that we should believe in any of this. I was uh, put off with the whole religious experience and annoyed by the whole thing. I didn't feel like I fit in and didn't feel like I wanted to be a part. I was in a church service, and I got up to leave because I was tired of the hypocrisy. I was going to go out to the car, and I was going to draw comic book characters in my sketchbook because I was a lonely nerd. As I was walking out the back door from the stage, the guy lead music goes, I don't know who this is for, but the Lord wants me to say this in the room. There is a young man right now who stands on a precipice of decision. And the Lord has a plan for you, but that plan is contingent upon what you're going to do. And he can bless you and be with you, or he cannot, but you have to decide what you're going to do. And there are people like you in the world who need to hear the gospel through you, but you have to make the decision what you're going to do. It wasn't hootie duty. It wasn't the moment that I'm like, ooh, I just knew that's for me. So you know what I did? Went right out to the car and drew the Incredible Hulk. Because in the same breath, God can speak to you, but that doesn't mean I have to be obedient to what he tells me. I was frustrated. But that was for me, and that was prophetic. That was God using somebody to be faithful. Now, in the same right, my mom and dad desperately wanted to have more kids. 
And they were doing all the things that you do, all the hoops you got to jump to to have more kids. And when you're going through that mess, it's a mess. And my mom had multiple, God bless them, multiple people have the epiphany from the Lord. The Lord just wanted me to tell you this, Janine. God just wanted me to let you know that you're going to have, I just saw you up there directing the choir and you were just bouncing a little baby girl on your hip with red hair. Now, if you live that, you can see why you may get a little cynical about charismatica stuff. You may be like, okay, you're full of garbage. Which brings me to the point that Paul doesn't make, but I think needs made. You've got to be really careful with this stuff. These gifts are available. God wants you to use these gifts. These gifts, when used appropriately, build the body of Christ. They add validity to what it is that we do. They can deepen your faith. You can understand God more. You can have spiritual experiences. But in the same right, if you manipulate them or you use these to control people or you say things that God didn't say, you can really harm and hurt people. Because when you do that, you now have become the voice of God for someone. And someone may hear you and go, well, God told them that, and why is that not happening to me? Well, let me tell you why, because God didn't tell them that. They're making it up. So my advice for everybody, and biblical advice, is you need to test everything that comes out of the mouth of anyone who claims to be from God against what it is that the Bible says. And you are not wrong if somebody tells you, God told me to tell you this, to do this. Thank you, but God talks to me too. So if he's got something to tell me, I'm open for that. Or to go, hey, Lord, it, hey Lord, it's me again. So-and-so caught me this morning and told me I'm not supposed to eat chocolate donuts ever again, and I'm a little confused by that. So if you can give me that word myself, I'd greatly appreciate it. There's nothing wrong in asking for confirmation that something is from God. And to hold everything with a little trepidation when people want to tell you things, especially when the things that you're going through are traumatic. You want to have more kids. You've got some health diagnosis that seems, you know, like the worst possible thing that you can have. And these are the moments that people feel like they want to say something. They want to do something that's going to make you feel better, that's going to be beneficial. And so then they step beyond the bounds of what they should and they speak in a way that they think they're being helpful or they even believe that God told them something when they really did. He really didn't. And so you got to be careful when you do that because you don't want people to walk away from a God who loves them because you were dishonest with what you say. In the Old Testament, if you were a prophet and you did that, we get to hit you in the head with a rock and be completely in the confines of Scripture. Right? Like, think about that. Like, it, you lied as a prophet, we're hitting you with a rock. And the church said, amen. Like, that's biblical. So you have to be careful what you do. But when you do it in the right way, it can be for an unbeliever. But in the same breath, that contradiction that's there, but then prophecies for believers, what's he talking about? Uh, he's saying that when you do that, when you prophesy... God speaks through you, and you see God's authority on full display. Listen, if you got doubt, and you got wonder, and you're like, do you think God's really out there? Do you think God's really real? And then you sit in a service where something supernatural happens, and somebody speaks through somebody. That, you don't think that that person has some confirmation in their heart and in their spirit that that's God? That they're like, I, would, I mean, God told me this thing to say, and I didn't know if I should say it, and I was worried, and I, and I just stepped out in faith and did what the Lord told me to do, and then, I was, and then afterwards this person came up to me and was mad at me because they were like, how did you know that was going on in my life? Well, that was God. That's God. And that, when you're a believer, those are the foundational moments. Those are the things that happen that you start to go, you know what, maybe this is more than just an ideology. Maybe this is more than just a philosophy for how I'm going to approach the world or how I'm going to live my life. Maybe there is a real, living, breathing God who wants to be in the lives of people and wants to interact and wants to speak, and all he's waiting on is for people to be obedient for that. There is a reason that Paul takes chapter 14 and lays out these things are important and this is how you should be doing them, and I want you 
to be doing them because the church needs to have spiritual moments so that the world can see God on display. Otherwise, what is this thing? This is just a self-help group where we get around and, and we talk about what, what, what was instead of talking about what is. God is alive. Christ died and resurrected. His power and authority is given to His people through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to give you gifts so that you can be effective in conveying the gospel. It is more helpful and beneficial for people, for those who are lost in darkness, to actually meet God than for you to tell them they don't have to be lost in darkness. Our message is not, hey, you don't have to stay out there. Our message is God loves you and wants to know you, and he wants to speak into your life, and he wants to see you become what he wants you to be. And here's the proof of that. These people speak in languages they do not know. These people prophesy in his name as God speaks through them and to them. Look at what is on display in the congregation of God's people. While I believe that charismatic movements can be in left field and can take advantage of this and manipulate it in the same breath, I also know that there is power and authority that comes upon people when they submit their will and allow the Holy Spirit to be the Holy Spirit. And what I will never understand understand is why any church or any person who calls himself a believer in Christ would want to so neuter the gospel and take all the power and all the authority out of it and try to do this thing but not have any of the spiritual aspects be a part of it. I don't understand what it is we're doing. If God has said, I want you to do these things, and I want there to be power on display, and I want to be able to move, and the only thing that holds him back from doing that is our own pride and our own fear and our own, ooh, this is weird, then what are you doing? It's a car analogy. My wife loves these. Buckle in. You don't buy a vet to drive 15 miles an hour. Nobody's like, oh, I'm, I need to go buy a brand new Corvette. I want to get the Z06 with the monster engine in it. And I want to, the thing will go, you know, zero to 60 in one second as it blows my shirt off my body. I want that one. But what are you going to do with it? Oh, I'm, I'm just going to put it in uh, drive and idle it back and forth in my yard. Why? Well, then I can tell everybody I have one. But isn't that kind of what we do? Like you have the power to heal people. You have the power to speak in my name. You have the power to see me on full display. If you'll submit your will and if you'll ask for these gifts, I'll give them to you. You have the ability to do things that are outside of the confines of creation. And what do we do? Our modern mind just goes, mm, this is weird. I feel weird about this. So Pastor Pat, you're saying that... That God wants to give me power and authority to do things that I'm not capable of doing? Yes! I'm nervous. I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't, how do I know I'll say the right thing? What if people have questions I don't know the answer to? And then you get to chapter 12, 13, and 14, and he's like, look, here I'm going to equip you so that you can take care of these anxiety issues that you have. You'll receive power and authority when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be able to speak in languages you don't know. Your, your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Like, this is the thing that's going to happen if we do this. And instead of a church being like, that's exciting. How do we do it? We're a church that wants to go, oh, I don't know. Are you sure? What if it's wrong? What if, this is weird. I don't think this is right. Let's not do this. Mm, no, let's just tell people Jesus loves them and just sit on our haunches and not use any of the power or authority that's out there. What do you think causes deliverance? What do you think sets people free? Jesus said, I'm leaving so another can come. Well, what's he talking about? The Holy Spirit. That when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that's where all power and authority comes from. So when we get to the end of this and we really start to process through what Paul is saying, what he's getting at is you need the Holy Spirit. You can't just take the Holy Spirit and put him in a box and don't ever talk about him and don't make eye contact and everything's going to be okay. And when you get to heaven, apologize. Because you're missing out on what God has for you. On the same right... We don't have to be weird about it, right? We don't have to be like, we're not going to have, welcome to church today, we're not even going to preach. Oh. 
We're just going to play the same chord on the organ. And then we're all just going to speak in tongues. Everybody put your left hand up. Close your right eye. Raise your left foot and repeat after me. Hyundai, 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 Hyundai. You're doing it. And God has to sit in heaven and go, what, what are you doing? This is weird. When I told you you're going to speak in tongues, what I meant was I was going to give you words to speak to people who didn't know uh, what language you're speaking so you could tell them that Jesus Christ died and resurrected from the dead. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way to come to the Father is through Him. That's what I was trying to do. And I was going to give you a heavenly language and, and fill you with the Spirit so that your, your spirit can utter out through your body. You have two souls. and so You have two bodies inside of you, two minds. You have a broken, sinful nature and you have a spirit man. That spirit man is desperate to speak and I was going to give him words. And you've turned it into a circus show. You've made this into some spectacle where we can all stand around and talk about how weird we are. When what I was trying to do was empower you so that you can be effective in the world. So that when people who are lost in darkness get around you, they go, something's different about you. What's different about you? And then God will speak right into your mind. Let me tell you what's different about me. He'll give you a recall of Scripture. He'll give you the things to say. He'll make you prophetic. But you just have to ask. So Pastor Pat, you're telling me, if I just go home and just by myself, just go, okay, God, I'm going to give you 10 minutes. I'd like to speak in tongues. That he'll give me speaking in tongues? He might. He might. There's a giant church in Texas, Gateway. Robert Morris is their lead guy. And, in, and when I say giant, I'm not talking giant in Decatur mind where it's like there's 600 people and then we're going to run around like we're a mega church. I'm talking giant like 25,000 people go to it. Robert Morris was a cessationist, didn't believe in speaking in tongues. He believed that when the Bible came, the need for the spirit, gifts of the Spirit stopped because the Bible is the completeness of the, that, that whole thing. He got convicted about it, and so he's walking around a swimming pool one night. And he goes, I don't know, God, if this is true or not, but uh, if, it, if it's true, then, Lord, I just pray that you would fill me with the Spirit and let me speak in tongues. He woke up four hours later, laid out on the ground, by his pool, just as weird as it comes, speaking in tongues. And ever since then, they've been like we are, where it's like, this is a thing, it's in the Bible, it's real, it's there, and we're going to approach it with trepidation, and we're going to teach it biblically, and we're going to encourage people to say this is a thing, but we're not going to be weird about it. That's how it should be. And then there also should not be for any of you as we come to a close. I don't want anybody to sit in it because this is what I grew up in. You also shouldn't sit through a message like this and get to the end of it and feel like that if you don't do this thing, that somehow your faith is cheapened. That somehow like you don't know who God is or that God doesn't love you or doesn't care about you. I have friends to this day who do not believe in Jesus and are not followers of Christ because of garbage Holy Spirit teaching at camp when we were kids. Because they stood at an altar for four hours trying to speak in tongues and never did. With leadership telling them that's because they had sin in their life or they were weak in their faith. Your salvation and your redemption and your call out of darkness is completely separate from what it is that you can accomplish inside of the Godhead once you know who Jesus is. And the opportunity that you have is the same the moment you accept Jesus. There is not some sort of spiritual hierarchy or grade system that you have to work your way up so you can become the grand high pumba of Christianity. All gifts, <coughs> all gifts and all authority and all ability is available to you at the moment you accept Jesus Christ. You don't make yourself holy. You don't make yourself some Holy Spirit superhero. You either believe in Jesus or you don't. And your depth of faith is contingent upon that belief. You are justified and saved by faith, not by Holy Spirit accomplishments. And if you never speak in tongues, if you never prophesy, you can't experience the full depth of God. There is nothing in Scripture to say to you that all of God and all that He has for you and all that He wants for you and all His power and all His authority is not available to you 
at the moment you accept Christ, there's nothing there to say that isn't true. That somehow there's more depth if you do this charismatic thing. That's not what that's there for. These charismatic things are so that you can be more effective in conveying what God has already shown you and given you to people who don't have that thing. So don't feel like, oh, I just, I guess I'm a sinner. I guess God doesn't love me. I just never have done this. I've never. Because also don't forget in chapter 12, Paul says that some of these, the, here are the gifts, and God gives each person a set gift, and these are the gifts that are given. Which also seems like, but wait, you want us all to speak in tongues, but you just said in chapter 12, I'm confused. Well, because Paul knows that, like, listen, I want you to all speak in tongues. It doesn't necessarily mean you all will. That's the implication of, I want you all to, but I'd rather you prophesy. What's he saying? I want you all to have spiritual gifts. I want you to use the spiritual gifts. These are the things I want you to have. But prophecy is the one that I really want you to have because it reaches people who are lost. And at the end of the day, Paul's heart is lost and broken people. So shockingly, the evangelist wants you to evangelize. So here at Vintage, when people ask, what are you? What do you believe? You get to tell them, well, good, there's a 45-minute message online. You can go watch because I'm not real sure what we are. We're definitely not full-blown Assembly of God charismatic, but we're definitely not cessationists. We're somewhere in the middle. But in the middle is where we need to be because I don't ever want to hamper the Holy Spirit. I don't want to put him in a box. I don't want to say we can't have things happen. I don't want those things to go on. If God tells you to say something, say it. If I think that it's inappropriate, I'll gun you for it. I'll do that in love as your pastor. But we need to be a church that's free to let God be God because this thing is spiritual. At the end of the day, this thing is spiritual. God is spiritual. God speaks to his people. He's alive and well. This is not some country club. This is not some archaic religion. This is a group of people who God literally dwells in and among. And when he dwells in among you, there are gifts and abilities that happen to you because he is dwelling in you. So let's be a church that's free to allow the Spirit to move. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning and pray for every person in this room. First and foremost, Lord, I pray you would help us get past the weird. Help us get past the weird. Open our minds. Open our hearts. Lord, we do not intend to make the Holy Spirit a spectacle. That's not our job. That's not what we're trying to accomplish here. But, Lord, we also don't want to be a church that's afraid to allow you to work through your people. Lord, I pray for every believer in this room that their heart and their mind would be open to your spirit. That, Lord, we can discover the gifts that you have for each and every one of us as we seek you out. Lord, I pray you would give gifts to those who ask for them. If it to be speaking in tongues, if it to be prophecy, Lord, whatever those gifts are, we are open to that and freely accept that here at Vintage. Lord, I pray, though, we would be a church that uses the spiritual gifts that are given to us in a way to convey your gospel. Our heart breaks for those who are lost and those who are broken, and we will take any edge that we can get to be more effective in conveying your cross to the people who need to know the power and authority that is available to them at your resurrection. Empower us, Lord, to be your ambassadors in this world. Use us, Lord. Speak through us. Speak to us. Give us a heavenly language. Give us prophecy and speak through us, Lord, in a way that the world looks at this and goes, something is different about those people. Something is different about what's going on there. God is amongst them. Push us out on the edge, Lord. Take us to the deep end of your spirit. Let us feel the emotional connection to you. Let us feel you in the room as we go into worship. Let us feel you as we go into our own personal prayer time. Be with us daily. Speak to us. Fill us with your power and with your authority. Lord, we are open to what it is that you have for us. And we freely accept what it is you want to give to us. And we pray you would use us to be effective in this world. In your name we pray. Amen.